quagmire of business life and make you better, I'm going to be happy. Just like that young kid that wrote me that letter. And um, uh, when we talk to some of the other people that I've, I've had dramatic impact on in their business careers, it makes me happy. And uh, so, um, but Napoleon Hill said it all. Because most of you, before I read it, most of you have been drawn to the the uh, money consciousness uh, uh, of not making money, but spasmodic or occasional effort will be of no value. You must apply until application becomes a fixed habit with you. Poverty is attracted to the ones whose mind is favorable to it. I have a whole family that could underline that sentence. I'm going to read it again. Poverty is attracted to the one whose mind is favorable to it, as money is attracted to him whose mind has been deliberately prepared to attract it. Poverty consciousness will voluntarily seize the mind which is not occupied with a money consciousness. A poverty consciousness develops without conscious application or habits favorable to it. The money consciousness must be created to order. You got to think about it, you got to live it, you got to breathe it, you got to diet. In the 10 years I grew Great Western Resources, I ate, slept, breathed Great Western Resources. You know why big-time, high-performance people have showers in their offices? I always wondered why CEOs had showers in their offices. Because I used to sleep at the office. Didn't have time to... I'm right. I didn't have time to go home. Now I know. Because I used to bundle up on the couch with my quilt. And the washman used to come around and say, Mr. P, everything all right? Of course, I used to sleep with a gun. I said, yeah, everything's fine. <laughs> everything's fine. But my whole life evolved around that. And I made a lot, a lot of money. And my partners made a lot of money. All the institutions, the Japanese National Oil Company, the Israeli government, the Kuwaitis, Prudential, I mean, uh, you name it, Citicorp. I mean, we all made a ton of money. Because I was living and breathing it. And Linda was spending it. I was living and breathing and making it, and Linda was spending it. And, you know, uh, but if you're not willing to, ma to make that kind of commitment, then don't beat yourself up. A guy at a management conference I gave for the Center for Entrepreneurial Management about a year ago, he got up, he was a Hispanic guy, he owned an um, electronics company. He says, you know, Dan, I really feel good that I came here because I know high performance living isn't for me. And now I'm not going to beat myself up anymore. It made me happy. It made me happy that now he doesn't have to go home and beat himself and flog himself anymore. Because it's not for everybody, ladies and gentlemen. That's, and whoever told you that it is, it just isn't. So if you get nothing more from today, you can go home and you don't have to have yourself, you don't have to beat yourself up. You've lived under the proposition that logic is the logical process which leads to an incorrect conclusion. You use logic to run your business. That's crap. You know, we're going to talk more about it tomorrow, but... When John Fitzpatrick Kennedy, Fitzgerald Kennedy, excuse me, said the day he got inaugurated, we we're going to uh, put a man on the moon this decade, land him safely, bring him back, and do this all before the Russians. There was nothing logical about that. As we know it today, we didn't have NASA. We didn't have a damn rocket that could take a 200-pound uh, payload off the ground. Ours weren't as good as Scud missiles. What happened? October something, 1969, we put a man on the moon. And that was a dodgy deal, too, because they ran out of fuel and all kinds of other things happened. Was that logical? Do you think anything great in this country was based on logic? They told Henry Ford, we can't make a V8. Oh, man, Henry, he didn't understand. He had about a fourth grade education. You're going to make a V8. You ain't going to be here. They come back from you later. We can't make a V8. I'm going to tell you again. They made a V8. Just think if you ran your businesses, or oh, forget your businesses, you ran your life like that. But as, as a requisite, you can't, you know, to run your life like that, you better not be worried what your neighbors think. Somebody asked me, I went to a deal for the school that my kids go to the other night because I kicked their ass and make a bunch of people put up 400 grand to build them a new gym. And I was one of the principal guys who put up most, uh, most of the money. And we sat there and he said, uh, would you like me to introduce everybody? I said, no, I don't want to know anybody here. Friends are problems. And what I got to say to this group, they don't want to know me anyway. And then I got up, 
and there were some people that you and I know mutually there, and I ripped them. I said, I'm embarrassed to be part of this group, even though I'm one of the principal guys who put up most of the money. Roosevelt High School donates from the, the alumni at Roosevelt High School give $250,000 a year, and the average median income from Roosevelt High School is $26,000. You pay your maids more than that here. And we got to go begging for $400,000. I'm embarrassed to be part of you. It's a crime. As a high-performance person, we have an obligation to give back. Because I assure you, you're getting a lot more than your money's worth out of this deal. Patience is just an excuse for procrastination. You notice how I can go up and down? <laughs> Unfortunately, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more patient. When I was younger, I wasn't so patient. A lot of people say I'm not so patient now, but I was a lot less patient when I was younger. And it's funny, I made a lot more money faster when I was younger. Funny how that works. Now I can understand that I, may, I deal with morons. You know, you know, everybody can't... Before, I didn't understand. I wouldn't talk to somebody that was a moron. Now I sit and listen to their moronic deal, da 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 Before, I wouldn't... Ah, shut up, get out of my office. And now I sit there and listen, my wife left me, my kids in juvenile hall, my this and my, so what? I mean, what's that got to do with the project? But now I listen, because I'm a kinder, gentler man now. I'm 49 years old now. Got gray hair, I've, I've, I've matured. And with maturity comes poverty. Because thinking is for people who can't take action. Just think all the doofuses we know over at Virginia. That's kind of an in-house joke there. The last part of creating your own foundation is to focus on the ends, not the means. Now, you've already figured out I'm a just, I just, the ends justify the means no matter what, short of murder or robbery. Another very famous uh, personal development guy who says success leaves clues, ladies and gentlemen. And speaking of success, one of my mentors slipped in the back of the room, Mr. Jerry Orman, who helped me in the energy business, who when I'm talking about the mentor uh, relationship, two of my mentors are still alive. One has uh, gone to the great, um, uh, um, I don't know what the hell. Boardroom in the sky. Well, I'm not so sure it's in the sky where Costa went, <laughs> but we'll talk, we'll talk about him later. Uh, but I'm sure when Mr. Orman leaves the earth, he's going to go to the one up in the sky. Of course, may have gone to one end of the ground, but um, success does leave clues. And when I was a young man in the oil business and I would hang around with Mr. Orman and a lot of other very successful oil men, it's because I wanted to be where they were. I didn't hang around with a roughneck, although that's how he came up. He used to be a roughneck. I didn't hang, I mean, I hung around with people that I wanted, I aspired to be. Now, one of the things, and this is slightly cutting my own throat and Ed's going to throw up here, the seminar groupies are an interesting bunch of people. You know, I, 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 when I decided to go into this business back in, well, actually, the first one I did was February last year, I attended a lot of seminars to see what the other guys had to say, which basically they had nothing to say, but I went to them all anyway. I paid. I didn't get comped and all this other crap that everybody does, and I didn't barter my, like, I mean, nobody ever, you know, the same one dollar is going around, everybody uses it. They barter it from one guy to the next guy, the next doofus, and he trades it off to this doofus. I mean, anyway, I paid my, my money. Uh, and, uh, but I saw the same people. I saw the same people at Gary Halbert in Florida, down in that dump he lives down there in uh, Key West. It's the first time I've ever seen people smoking dope on the streets. And you go into a restaurant, it smells like a marijuana factory. I hadn't seen that since the 60s. Key West, I say, you know, they're still back in that time warp. It's the 60s back there. And, uh, but I went to all these seminars. I saw the same people. Kennedy, Ted Nicholas, who I have a lot of respect for. I think he's the best, arguably the best copywriter in the country, maybe the world. Uh, uh, Jay um, Abraham, same guys, same ladies, going from one to one to the other, looking for the fix. Guess what? I mean, they didn't get it. Like, I didn't know I was a no money down real estate deal until Burl started using my methods for no money. No, I didn't know. I, I've never, I don't like real estate. I sold it with a, a high price salesman, but I never bought any. Most of my assets are not in real estate, except for houses. But it's the same people. And, be, and the reason it's the same people, ladies and gentlemen, going from one guy to the other guy, because the crap doesn't work. 
Otherwise, you wouldn't see the same people going from guy to guy to guy to guy to once in a while a lady, the guy to guy to guy, because it doesn't work. I don't know of many of the people that have attended my deals that have ever gone to anybody else, other than the poke fun, which isn't the right thing to do. But the, uh, I kind of like it, but it's not the right thing to do. Because the other stuff doesn't work. Because at the bottom, the reason I stay doing this is that I want to evoke permanent lasting change. And the only way you get permanent lasting change is through replication. And um, these other things, basically, their seminars are one, one sale to sell you something else to sell you something else. And, 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 I, and I truly hope to the extent that I'm on another panel or I go someplace, unless you're coming to hear me, that I don't ever see any of you at another seminar. There's three or four or five good seminars in the country. And that's it. And, and, um, but that's it. There's only a few. There's only a handful. But there are some good ones. But most, most of them aren't. And I would, I would investigate. We're going to talk about investigating before you invest. And, uh, and it's hopefully you'll be a smarter seminar buyer, if that's the right terminology. One of the questions that I get on the uh, critique sheets and I'm asked during the seminar is about balance. I already talked about Eric Hyden. And again, Napoleon Hill has done it much better than I. He interviewed 500 men over 20 years. And of the 500 richest men that he was introduced by Mr. Carnegie, he only met three. That's three. I don't know what three is, is, is as a percentage of 500, but it's not very big. He met three people that were almost, I emphasize the word, almost at peace with themselves. Almost happy. Three out of 500. Doesn't sound like too much balance to me. Three. So when I hear, when I'm down in San Diego in the airy fairy land down there in Cartify the Sea, I want balance, Dan. Well, maybe the speakers down there got balance because they're basically all poor. And maybe that's how you get balance. But there is no balance in a high-performance life. Eric Hyden, 36-inch thighs, Mark Spitz, you name it, they don't have balance. Because they're dedicated and devoted to that one thing. And unless you're dedicated and devoted, the chances of you being a high performance, super high performance person to grow your life and or your business quantumly, geometrically, exponentially, don't expect balance. I have balance now because I'm already rich. So anybody that tells me any different hasn't been there and hasn't done it. And I've never seen anybody debate that issue with me. But anything doing is worth doing badly, and I do a lot of bad things badly. For those of you that have seen me play tennis recently, I've kind of given up on tennis, though. It even got so bad that I gave up. And when I give up on something, I mean, it's got to be close to death. I want you to go out there and do it right, not do it right. Instead, no, do it right away instead of doing it right. I'm not even drinking. Water makes my tongue tight. Most of you want to get it right instead of doing it right away. Because the longer you procrastinate, the, 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 the farther out, excuse me, the further out, you can delay whether you're going to fail or not. Most successful people do it poorly until they do it well. Just keep blundering. You cannot wait until you're just exactly right. Perfection, and this is what I can tell this group right now, perfection equals paralysis. Perfection equals paralysis. For those of you that are computer nerds, you fall into that category. Lotus, one, two, three. You can crunch crap till the cows come home now. And that's wrong. Trump walks into a building or a casino, yeah, he can, you know, he can see the this, that. Whoops. He can see whatever and walks out. He doesn't want to go have anybody crunch any numbers. Where they crunch numbers is how big of a hosing are we going to give the other side? That's when he crunches the numbers. How much can we rip off this person? How can we peel him like a banana? How can we rip his face off? How can we tear his lungs out? That's when they crunch the numbers. Not whether it's a good deal or not. I said earlier, when that hot woman or that hot man with that tight ass walks by, you know they're hot right away, don't you? You don't have to go home and think about it. Whether you're married or not, whether you have a significant other or not, he or she is either hot or they're not. 
You either want to jump on their bones or you don't. It's that simple. Business is that simple. And anybody that tells you any different has not been there and has not done that, by definition. Things should be done 17 times before they're absorbed. 17. Just think of the things that you've done 17 times. You can probably count them on one hand, one finger. And we're not talking about your practice wings, Craig. Because more of the same just gives you more of the same. I wish it were different, but it's not. And it is no use saying we're doing our best. If you ever tell me that, I'm going to rip your tongue out of your mouth. Because you've got to be, you have to, got to succeed in doing what is necessary, as Mr. Churchill said. I don't want to hear you doing your best. Hear that, doofuses? I don't want to hear that. It's what's necessary. And if that means being gone on your mother's birthday, being gone over Hanukkah or Christmas, or Cinco de Mayo, for the Chicanos in the audience, I, I don't care what the hell it is, because at the end of the day, when it's my money, you better do what's necessary. Or you, be, you better give your soul to God because your ass is going to be mine. Everybody says they're doing their best. Best doesn't get it done. Best keeps you in the minor leagues. Well, we're through the introduction. It went so quickly, I can't believe it. See how time flies when you're having a good time? Are there any questions on what we've covered to date? Okay, would you please... Yes, sir. I'm glad you asked me that question. You know how I said that you become what you think about? Obviously, when I was a youngster, a teenager, in my early 20s, I thought about one thing, and I didn't become that thing. Otherwise, I'd be looking like an organ up here because I only had my mind on one thing. I was fairly laser beam focused in those days. I think, in fact, I transcended laser beam focus because I was only interested in one thing. I think all I do, especially during those ten, that one 10-year period, I thought about how to get more money for my projects, how to be exposed to more projects, how to meet more people that could get me more money and or expose me to more deals. My whole life revolved around that. And one of the basic reasons that, is that right? Yeah, no, wrong side. I like that. One of the basic reasons, other than I wanted to get away from my parents and my in-laws that we moved to Scotland, is because we were going public in the UK and I wanted to have a presence there. And perception is reality. Now, if you're a Scottish institution and you see that the uh, largest shareholder chairman of one of the public companies you're investing in just makes a commitment, like, and this is a big time commitment, has his daughter just born there. I mean, everything I did, every single solitary thing I did, every single solitary dinner I went to, every single solitary event I went to, every single thought process that I had was devoted to building Great Western. Five years in a row, we were the fastest growing great, uh, natural resource company in the world. Five years in a row. My whole life, everything was devoted to getting more money, being exposed to more money, looking at more deals, pumping uh, smoke up the backsides of my advisors, getting them promoted above the uh, head of the curve, which we're going to talk about. So they, are, they, they were impassioned with the same, in the same way that I was. When we talk about growing a, a, an organization, you've got, to, that, you've got to share that passion with your employees. If your employees don't have passion, first of all, if you don't have passion, forget it. Might as well blow your brains out. I mean, forget it. Retire, sell your little businesses, you know, get whatever little pennies you can and go live in Cardiff by the sea. Because if you don't have passion, how in the hell can you get your employees to be passionate about something? How can you get your employees to... I go to these uh, friends of mine businesses, they, the work stops at 4.30. If you stand by the elevator, you'll be trampled like, like, like steers running over the top of you. How can you expect your employees to be passionate if you're not? If you don't care, 
if you just like your, your business is running along, you know, like a single proprietor or a mom and pop or whatever the hell, that's fine. But that's not what this seminar is all about. This seminar is about geometric growth. And after, uh, uh, well, actually starting uh, pretty soon, we're going to hear four or five people in the audience that have had some geometric growth in just 18 months, less. But it wasn't because they didn't spread their passion. And ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it means you've got to say, you know, we're going to talk more specifically what, what, what quantum means. But I'm going to make a comment right now. Sometimes it's a, tr a complete reversal to do something opposite. In the 1800s, the Matterhorn had never been scaled. Matterhorn, which is in a, a mountain that's got Switzerland on one side, Italy on one side, and Austria on the other. The Alps, it's that one that you always see in these movies and the postcards. In the 1860s or 1870s, countless uh, Austrians, countless English, English like to die on mountains. A lot of Englishmen died on that mountain. They just like to do that. It's like Dunkirk. It's like the Dunkirk syndrome before. It was the Matterhorn syndrome. Dozens and dozens and dozens of Brits have died on that mountain. Well, one Brit decided in 1865 or 1885, something like that, that um, he was going to try a different way. So they decided they walked around the other side of the mountain and they walked to the peak. You could actually walk. Even as out of shape as this audience is, you just can walk up. There's a road. It's like a path. It's built in the rock. And for a hundred years, they've been trying to scale it one, you know, the, the face that goes like this. Right. But you can walk up. There are things that you can do in your business that you've never tried. Not for any good reason. Mostly because of the conditioning that you've had here before is bad. And you just try something different. Another example of this is, you know, when you see the fly beating his little head against the uh, window pane and you'll see dead flies. Of course, none of the houses here, they're all clean up the dead flies. There are no dead flies on windows, on, on the sills anymore. And here you've got an open window just five feet away or an open door. The little fly just keeps... That's you and your business. Up against that window pane, and then there's an open door five feet away. That's what quantum thinking and quantum growth's all about, is doing something dramatically different. Sometimes it's 180 degrees different. Sometimes it's selling what you've got and doing something else. I was at a, at a meeting of the CEO clubs here, uh, uh, or sen again, the Center for Entrepreneurial Management. I was giving a speech about a year ago, and a man said, got up and he said, I've lost 55 or 65 percent of my retained earnings and my net worth of my company that I've built over the last 35 years and the last three years. And he says, there's no prospect, prospect for it changing. Now, my advice to him was to turn the key, close the business down. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that went over like a fart in a punch bowl. I mean, he didn't want to hear that. Now, I don't know if that applies to anybody in this room, but you know, there's, there are things that are mature industries. The steel industry up until the last five or 10 years was mature. You, you couldn't make money in steel because of the Japanese competition. Now it's turned around. But at, you know, people that closed down steel mills 20 years ago were doing the right thing. But see, to make those kinds of decisions, well, have I pissed my whole life down the drain? I mean, have I done everything wrong? Fear, anxiety, all, I mean, you got to suck up your pantyhose to make those kind of decisions. And not everybody in the world is capable of sucking up your pantyhose. It's just not. That's fine. There was a book in the early 70s, I'm okay, you're okay, which basically was a doofus book that said, anything you want to do is fine, and, and everything I want to do is fine, and it, that's a bullshit book. But I mean, basically, it's, it's all right if, you know, it's fine. I'm okay, you're okay. You know? I'm sure they, uh, to the extent that I have any friends which, well, you know, I don't care if I have any or not. My wife cares more about that stuff than I do. But, I mean, the, the, the social gatherings that I'm in, uh, involved in are, are limited. Very limited. I like it that way. I've never talked to any of my neighbors. My, one of my neighbors shocked me. Introduced herself. Said, I'm a friend of so-and-so. I said, so what? I have a putting green and I have a putting green and bunkers and stuff in my background. I was minding my own business. Hitting golf balls out of my bunker into my, my green. This lady comes up and says, hi, I'm a friend of so-and-so. Yeah, yeah, okay. Bam, I'm hitting golf balls, hitting golf. Yeah, yeah, I'm a friend of so-and-so, you know. I, yeah, my wife's interested in that stuff. Why don't you tell her that? And that's the truth. I like it that way. I just do, you know. It makes life a lot simpler. I can focus on what I want to do. Most of you, ladies and gentlemen, focus on, one, what you think is appropriate. See, talking about being successful, talking about making more money, talking about being a high-performance person is vogue. You talk about at cocktail parties. It used to be like in the 60s and 70s talking about smoking dope and getting laid. Doesn't mean that you want to. It's just the thing to talk about. Just like in certain sets, it's the thing to talk about, bitch, about how lawyers screw you. 
I found my relationship with lawyers to be great. One of the reasons I've made as much money is because of the good lawyers I've had over the years. One of the reasons I've made as much money is because of the top-notch accountants I've used. But I haven't been using my brother-in-law or Schwartz and Company or, you know, Doofus, uh, a, a, a personal corporation. I've been using high-powered accountants and high-powered lawyers. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. If you're not running your business like you're going to go public, you should be, because that means you do the best you can afford, the best you can afford. I always use the best I couldn't afford. I can afford it now, but when I started, when I was at some of the stages you're at, I always stretched because I didn't want to make a short-term solution to a long-term problem. The long-term problem was gathering money. You know how easy it is to get money from a financial institution if you have audited big six numbers? How much easier it is than if you got your brother-in-law or some doofus controller that you pay $28,000 a year doing your numbers? When I see numbers like that, I say, this is a joke. I don't want to look at these because I know they're bogus. I had a CFO who was a world-class finance guy, a great Western, a guy named John Ernest, who I happened to talk to last night. And he used to give me the numbers. He was controller for Worldwide for golf, and he was uh, um, chief financial officer at Chevron. He said, when he used to give me the numbers, he said, Dan, at best, these are wrong. But they're our best guess, and they'll get us by the bank. Because they were. And we had very sophisticated internal financial controls. Most of you have no financial controls. Most of you sign checks in your own companies. I never signed a check in my company from the day I started it to the day I left. I never had check signing authority. Never. I didn't want to be involved with that. Okay. We're going to break for lunch. You, you need to talk to him. We're going to break for lunch. We're only going to take um, 45 minutes for lunch. Uh, what time does everybody have? Five of? Ten of. Ten of? Okay. We'll only take 40 minutes for lunch. Uh, we'll be back at 1230. Um, if you're going to eat here, you better tell them to get, get, you know, get hustle because otherwise they, they give you your menu about 40 minutes from now. The food's good, though. And uh, we're going to talk when we get back about you as individuals. And so be thinking about that. And um, we're going to devote how we react through the rest of the seminar to your individual challenge. See, I'm trying to be 90s problems. Okay, thank you very much. Now, normally, it's been my experience that, or actually it's been my perception, and I was wrong, wrong, that we, don't do, we didn't do this portion of the seminar till the end. But I've learned over, over time that, contrary to what I thought, that the attendees aren't as stupid as I thought they were, and they really do understand their problems so it's, e it's better for us to go through them at the beginning so we can work through them as opposed to me to come at the end and play God and at the last moment. And that's why we're, uh, we're, we've changed it around. For those of you that have been seeing me a lot of times, you've known that in the longer the three or five or six day seminars, we normally do this towards the end. Um, but it's, 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 it's critically important that one, you speak with candor. And I know that that's difficult for some of you because you've been conditioned to bullshit and not, you know, not tell the things that hurt. Because some of you, it's like uh, we're going to talk about what I call a pay price to action. You know, if you're 10 pounds overweight, you know how to lose 10 pounds. But you don't want to. You don't want to give it. So, I mean, that's why beat ourselves up about it. Most of you know what's, what, what <clears throat> what's wrong with your business or your career or your whatever you want to change. And so when you're up here with the, with the mic and with me, I mean, be uh, specific, speak in candor and... Uh, because that way you'll get the best um, input back from me. Um, Ed, are we about ready? And the microphone is? Right here. Oh, okay. Um, see how they used to do eeny, meeny? We'll start here. And if you, uh, they, they want to memorialize this for time eternal, we're going to hermetically seal this and put it in a time capsule in East Los Angeles, near the body where I came from, probably where no less than 500 people have been shot and stabbed in the last 35 years. So when you're talking to the camera, look back at them and tell them what you hope to gain, what your revelation, what your challenge is, etc. Shoot. I'm Dave Reeker, and I'm working for a company based out of Vancouver, Washington. Can we look back yep, at them? please. And we sell marketing information via a newsletter. That's the front end of the business, and we sell professional products and books and tapes 
And I've been involved now with it for six months. That was my dream to get involved with it. I'm with a very professional copywriter, and which is what I wanted to do. The business has been stagnant for probably five or six years, mainly because <clears throat> he's been happy. You know, he's 70 some years old. Now he's got new life because I've come into the picture, and um, our goal is to triple the subscriber base within the next six months to 12 months and then of course to to double it every year after that you know there i've got very high goals with that as far as the the newsletter that's the base of the business that's um just one avenue of what i really want to do but i see that as being first i want to start buying and selling businesses also and getting involved with other type of marketing and business involvement not just selling marketing newsletters and information to people that own businesses um, but I see that as being the first avenue. I'm with a copywriter who knows probably just as much as the best copywriters there are, so I'm picking his brain and I'm working with him. And that's great, but uh, I'm trying to help increase the business, and he's setting his ways, but uh, I think there's a happy medium there. I think he really wants to, to see this thing increase, and I'm, I'm the guts behind it. I mean, I'm the push behind it. I really want this thing to go big, and I'm putting everything I have into it. Um, we're in the process of publishing it. Uh, very um, works by a very fabulous uh, marketer. His name was Maxwell Sackheim, and uh, he died 12 years ago. We found the manuscripts. They were kind of buried in a file cabinet, so we're in the process of publishing those. Um, that's going to give me some credibility and uh, get things going as far as finances for myself and, and give us some capital to, uh, to start advertising the business because um, that's great, but we really need to get more people involved with the newsletter. And... Uh, we also have a service where people come in and do consultations for their own businesses, and uh, we give them marketing advice um, and so forth and write their sales letters for them. He's a master at this, but uh, like I said, he's been kind of complacent over the years, and um, that's where I'm coming involved. My involvement is now getting getting the business back on its feet, and it'll eventually be mine. He only plans you know on, that or you think that? I know that. It's already been, it's already been put into the important papers and so forth. He and I have really clicked. I mean, he doesn't have a family. I'm his now his family. It's good. And uh, <laughs> it's good. There, there's some great things here. I, re I really feel for him. I mean, it's more than just it's more than just uh, the opportunities. However, the opportunities are what brought us together, and uh, my vision and dream is what put us together in the first place. Now I'm carrying that to the next step, and that's to get this thing launched off the ground. I have big dreams, very big dreams, and of course, since I've met and listen to some of your things my dreams have really increased over the last 30 days they're so big now that i have no doubt that i can achieve them but uh they're huge it'll take me a lifetime to accomplish we'll, we'll, we'll get back to him we'll get back to everybody but i'm just going to throw out some general comments about what he said how old is this guy he's 71 his health isn't isn't great and um he just wants to sit back he wants to watch me do things in a few years he's he's the expert in advertising so of course it's gonna he's gonna continue to do that why i do all the legwork the pr work the, the 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 things that are necessary out about he doesn't like to leave the home anymore because he has trouble walking um uh <clears throat> quickly one in my judgment i wouldn't wait a few years i mean uh, in a nice way i try to get out get him out as quickly as humanly possible number two how long have you been there S less actually less than six months as a partner three months but i worked three months to in, get in, to that in, partnership. In, in three months from now you'll know everything you need to know from this guy and you can always fall back on his expertise, whether he's working there or not. Does he have any hobbies? Is there anything he likes to do? Philosophy. He loves to read. Mm, loves to read. <laughs> <laughs> be better if he liked women or something, chase women. Well, he, he does. <laughs> I mean, but, I mean, uh, 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 help him indulge him, his, his, himself with his, some other passion. And uh, because it's obvious, at least uh, for right now, his passion has left this business. And his passion is you now, taking it so it's not going to die when he dies. Uh, somehow get the point across to him sooner than later because every three or six month increment that we you're going to wait because you're learning more remember it's not a matter of being ready to take the helm it's a matter of being comfortable i mean the kurt gibson story and all these i mean it's uh was i ready to uh, to, uh take the helm of a company that uh, was a hundred times larger than i that my company was when i made my first big acquisition no was i comfortable yes i was comfortable with my abilities I, my, my intuition tells me that you've already, in another three months, you'll know more than enough to take the company to the next level. So uh, we'll, we'll come back to this, but my initial advice is to do it a lot sooner than later and not wait. Um, okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Cummings. Thank you.
Uh, <clears throat> and um, I'm in the educational business right now, and I knew exactly what I was going to say until right before the break you said, are you focusing on what you think is appropriate? And I definitely am, which is, shoots my whole life plan down the, down the drain. So, um, let, me, let me just interject something. <clears throat> this is especially uh, true of uh, uh, minority kids that get out of school and think they've got to give something back to the minority community. You know, I, come, I'm, I was a lettuce picker or the son of a lettuce picker from whatever. That's all crap. I mean, if your race doesn't want you to go be the best you can, whether you give anything back to lettuce pickers, then piss on them. I mean, that's not what it's all about. That's not what made this country great. It wasn't going back and helping the, the, the nine lettuce pickers from your county. What made this country great is people leaving the lettuce picking place and going off and doing something else. And, and, and that's why young kids, you, you look like a young 26. Kid, a baby. Uh, you know, I got shoes older than her, you know? I got shoes older than her. Anyway, I mean, the, 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 the young gen, this generation, the 18 to 30 and early 30s, the, you know, that's their cop-out. See, the, in my judgment, that's normally their cop-out to do something politically correct. Politically correct, you don't make any money, you know? I mean, fine, if you don't want to make any money, then be, you know, like Nader, the guy that, uh, the politically correct guy that, oh. that used to live with his mother until she died here a couple of years ago. I mean, but that's not what this is all about, so you, you're right. Well, that's the whole thing. Okay, I'll go forward. I um, was illiterate until I was 16, and um, this one English teacher basically saved my butt. I was delinquent and getting in trouble with the law and all that and getting kicked out of high school. And I, um, through her, her efforts, I learned to read, and I became a straight-A student and, and graduated. So I felt obligated to come back. And this is a, coming back to the Canal, <clears throat> Canal Valley uh, here in Southern California was the last thing I promised myself I'd ever do. But for some reason... You, you are from the lettuce picking up there? Yeah, Ventura. Oh, just... <laughs> okay, go ahead. I, I thought I was just guessing because I know there's a lettuce picker in the audience. That's why I was saying. Go ahead. But anyways, <clears throat> I, I came back to, to the Caneo Valley and, and um, where I know I'm not supposed to be, but through a sense of guilt or, or obligation... Guilt's the right word. Guilt. I call it Jewish guilt, whether you're Jewish or not. <clears throat> uh, J Jewish people put the guilt on you better than anybody else I know. So that's why I call it Jewish guilt. But I mean, most of us act our whole careers are based on guilt from our parents from somebody from giving back to the community i mean if our community our relatives our parents or whoever don't want us to be the best we can then the hell with them i mean and and uh the one thing that my mother's pretty good at putting jewish guilt but it hasn't worked on me because i don't care you know and 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 i've lived my whole life and all these high performance people that i've alluded to have lived their whole lives almost guilt free so go ahead so my, my problem is now that um, everything that I really wanted to do, I steered away from because people have said, uh, you know, you can't be that powerful, or you're, you're a bitch, you're... Um, <clears throat> These are all you're, poor you're, people, right? Yeah, you're cutthroat, <laughs> all that stuff. That's but, great. Or, you know, don't aim so high, you're, you can be disappointed, all that. Um, so my dilemma now is, now that I real, I just plunked down a nice chunk of change opening a, a friggin' learning center. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So, um, so and what do I, you do now? I came here to grow the learning center, but now I realize I just probably just want to sell it. Um, I don't know what I do now. There's probably somebody doofus enough in here to buy it from you. <laughs> I, I, what's, I, I got two or three prospects I know that, that are probably on the... You remember when I said we were giving them a little on the 100 IQ? I'll, 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 you probably... I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll point them out to you so you can, you know, you can jump on them like stink on a skunk and, and uh, sell your business. But no, you're right. And see, remember I said quantum thinking is sometimes a complete reversal? Thank you, God. One person already got it. I'm only talked to two so far. I mean, and that doesn't mean everybody won't get it. It's not likely everybody's going to get it, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's turning the key instead of wasting your whole life on something that's going to amount to piss. I mean, with a tidy bowl, man. I, and, and understanding that, it's going to the other face of the Matterhorn. It's, you know, it's the fly up against the window pane. That's exactly what it is. And when we get to it tomorrow when we talk about the difference between micro and macro thinking yeah. my reversal was I was a detail oriented guy I was a computer nerd before they had computers I used to spend Saturday and Sundays planning from Monday through Friday the entire day I used to go in the office and I had all these great schedules and, and then when somebody canceled an appointment with me I'd be I, I'd go into limbo I didn't know what to do because my whole schedule well, I'm gonna go to Philadelphia to see this and I wasn't smart enough to know I needed to make 15 appointments to have three or four or five in Philadelphia I made two and so they, I'm there with my thumb up my ass because one of them canceled. But that's what, that's what quantum thinking's all about. And that, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> yeah, um, right before the break, he, David asked me if I was okay because I'm, I 
so all of a sudden got very nauseous when I went from being micro to macro. And uh, so I, I skipped lunch. <laughs> yeah, I liked it. <laughs> yeah, I skipped lunch because I didn't want to lose it on the table here. <laughs> but um, so I'm, I'm real excited to be here. It's, uh, it's uncomfortable, but it's exciting at the same time. That's great. Now, let me just make a, a couple more comments. Your idea, your initial idea, uh, well, actually, your initial idea to get into the educational business, you've already figured out that's not what you really want to do. And that's right. You probably should sell it, uh, sell it to somebody that's already in the business, uh, the, the two or three doofus morons that are sitting around here that maybe I could, I could help convince buy it. But, I mean, that's absolutely right. Oh, no, the one doofus educator left. Harvard wanted to remember educational business. Ruben, remember how Fidel wanted to start that educational bullshit? Oh, he left. I'll give you his number, though. <laughs> I'll give you his number. He's one of my Harvard doofuses. No, no, he's brought it up again. No, no, you got it. He didn't get over it. But um, no, that's great. That's super. You're on the right Thank track. You. Great. My name is Michael Edwards, and uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Dan, as many of you did, at the Town and Country Hotel. And uh, it was really great. I just walked right up to Dan in the bar and introduced myself, and I felt right at home. So I really want to thank you for making yourself available as a mentor to me and a lot of other people. What I do is uh, essentially, basis, basically, I am uh, part of a rapidly growing company that uh, is in the travel business, and we've modeled ourselves after a company that does $20 million a year, and they have 20,000 members accumulated over a four-year cycle. What we intend to do is cut that in half and make uh, 20,000 members within a two-year cycle and outdo them in their annual production as soon as possible. How we do that is we market a travel agent card that anyone who does any traveling can benefit by. And uh, the challenges are, excuse me, Dan, the problems are, is that uh, it's such a new concept. It is, it is contrary to the old conventional thinking that uh, in some ways we're up against a, a rock and hard place because a lot of people think that they can't buy this. It's illegal. It's a scam. That sort of thing. And the truth of the matter is, is that this whole industry was deregulated during the Reagan administration in the 80s so that anybody in this room, for example, could become a legitimate bona fide outside travel sales agent and then accumulate all the benefits that a travel agent used to be able to get by coloring their hair blue and sitting for, uh, uh, in front of a computer for $6 an hour. <laughs> and, you know, so they could uh, brown bag it somewhere in some hotel and get 50% off. What we're going after are entrepreneurs and people who are uh, in, uh, in the business of traveling and maximizing their sales, maximizing their net co cost savings via this particular vehicle. And uh, as I say, the biggest problem we have is letting people know, A, it's legit, and B, going through the process of educating them. So sometimes the sales cycle is a little elongated, more elongated than I'd like it to be because I'm with you. I'd like to close them right away. But there's that process that takes place that some people are insisting upon, and I don't want it, but it seems to be out there <laughs> that people really need to go, well, you know, how do, I, how do I really work this? Is it okay? Does it work? I don't feel right about it. Entrepreneurs see this right away. They say, how much will it save me? I'll tell them it's going to pay for itself in your first trip. They buy it. But a lot of the so-called general public, which unfortunately or fortunately is going to be a huge amount of our market, are, they're still hemming and hawing and sitting around with their thumbs up their butt. So how would you address my, that, please? My initial thought is that um, double the exposure, or at least double or quadruple the exposure to people, either by seminar, free seminars, uh, get in front of uh, associations, uh, you know, for everything from the Kiwanis to the Daughters of the... Uh, no, you don't have Daughters of the American Revolution over here. I'm thinking I'm in Texas still. Uh, the Kiwanis, Rotary, uh, Red Cross, uh, uh, alumni associations, the California State University, which I'm on the trust, board, trust fund board and a bunch of the other boards, they have an association that builds... or builds, excuse me, uh, 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 offers life insurance, medical insurance to all California State Universities. There's 22 campuses, you know, San Jose State, San Diego State, Cal State, Norwich, L.A. State. And, 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 and get in front of a group, there's 300 and, I think 355,000 alumni, I think. And um, one guy makes the decision. Actually, it's, it's a group. One guy gives it to the board, then we make the decision. But I mean, it's one presentation, potential 355,000, because they're virtually, we all buy it. I mean, we don't ask questions. We, we, we assume, because there's guys like me on the board, that, that we do our homework. We're not just shoveling out crap to the alumni. But I mean, where, where you're getting, the most bang for your buck. You're being exposed to the most people for the, few, the shortest amount of time. So that's one presentation that affects a lot of people. Um, they, um, and Cal State University system, that's just one state. They have the university system, which is like UCLA, Berkeley. They have a similar thing that you can buy insurance and stuff through that. And there are different associations like that where you're, you're, you're making maybe the same amount of presentations, but you're being exposed to hundreds and hundreds, of, maybe millions of people, potential prospects where you only have to make the sale once. 
the key in this kind of selling that's been my experience <clears throat> is you have to ex uh, increase the exposure that you have to people and the way you do that is you're making key presentations to a group or one person that is making a choice that will affect many many hundreds of thousands of people and uh, or many thousands depending on the market I mean there's real estate associations uh, there's all kinds of associations so I would I mean I'll come back with more as the two days go on but off the top of my head uh, you're right it's easier to convince one guy you can make four or five presentations and having to convince 500 four or five times and, and that's what I would do thank you okay sir your name and where you're from yeah my name is Lou Pals I'm from Alberta Canada and I'm an air traffic controller by trade I'll be retiring in the next three years and I'm in real estate involved in real estate up there buying renovating and renting out however that's working uh, harder instead of smarter I'm looking uh, to change that maybe to buy and turn real estate a little bit quicker I'm an accomplished uh, long distance runner, 100 mile mountain runner, and I'm very so am I. and I'm uh, very health conscious. So I like to market. I'm not so health conscious anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm interested in uh, marketing uh, information, how-to information, and so on, how to improve your health and uh, running and so on. And uh, I have one uh, disagreement with you, Dan, about uh, seminars. I've been a seminar junkie in the past, so to speak. However, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have met you if I hadn't been, uh, you know, attending Even a, a seminar. Even a blind horn get an acorn once in a while. <laughs> However, be that what it may, I'm uh, happy I did uh, attend the San Diego seminar and uh, attended your one-day uh, workshop you had there, and uh, it's changed my thinking, uh, well, almost in quantum leaps already. I've uh, bought the Rob Report the last two issues, and I'm dreaming a lot bigger now, and I used to buy the ink and the success magazines and whatnot, but... Uh, Notwithstanding, I'm speaking at their conferences <laughs> next year. Keep buying their magazines. <laughs> but, I mean, that's right, buy that... Um... I'm going to get around to that later on when we talk about gold, but go ahead. Right. And uh, I just want to uh, make leaps and bounds, great strides forward in a relatively short period of time. Like I say, working mm -hmm. smarter instead of harder, which I've been doing over the years for the last 30 years or so. Well, I mean, by definition, when you're starting out on a new career, you're going to grow geometrically because you're coming from ground zero. I mean, as, as, as I said earlier, those of you that can remember back to when you started your business and you had that passion, by definition, you're growing geometrically. What happens, and as we talked about in San Diego, we're going to talk about again tomorrow, is but your curve flattens out because for whatever reason you become satiated, you become comfortable like your uh, older partner. And it's one thing to become satiated and comfortable when you're 70, 75, 80. That's one thing, you know. But I mean, uh, when you're 25, 35, 45, 55, in my judgment, 60, I mean, there's no reason. And there's certain people in this room that I know that are a lot older than 60. Some are almost 75 now. They still aren't satiated. My, one of my mentors is sitting in the back of the room. The, um, so by definition, you're going to grow geometrically. And what you'll learn today and tomorrow and the next day is how to maintain that passion, maintain that, and that, that, that uh, perseverance. And part of it is like Jim Ryan said, motivation gets you started, habit. Most of you, ladies and gentlemen, have bad habits. You hang around with the wrong kind of people. Doofuses. We're going to talk about the doofus test like I did in San Diego. Most of the, your friends and uh, colleagues and acquaintances and relatives couldn't pass my simplest doofus test. I mean, they just couldn't. And, you know, up until I started, other than my kid brother, I don't see my family. And I'm not bragging about it. I mean, it's nothing I'm proud of. It's just, it's, it's a decision I made in my life because I don't want to be like them. And uh, the, uh, and certain people that, you know, the people that I went to high school, I already told you, well, my best friend's serving life for murder in Florida. I mean, the guys that, uh, that I hung around with all got in a lot of trouble. And, and, the, and uh, the, uh, we'll have to swap notes a little later on who got in more trouble uh, first. But a girl can always get in a more different kind of trouble than a guy. <laughs> yeah, I always envy girls. When I come, well, I'll tell you that when I'm not being taped. Because when, when I, when, uh, I'll talk about later on about if I had my life to live over, the only thing I do is ch change my goals and make them higher. But if I could come back at something else, then that's a whole different story. Uh, but the, uh, so you're, you're starting off, and I, and I envy people that are starting from ground zero because it's a lot easier to have positive reinforcement. It doesn't, I mean, what you've been taught is you're going to have a lot of failures, a lot of negative things, but that's the glass is half empty, the glass isn't half full. It's exciting. It's like, you know, I, I, I ran uh, my first, well, I only run 100 mile once, but I mean, the first time I did it, I was all excited and I had all this passion. The, my 100-mile race uh, t took the passion out of me. Uh, I ran 20 hours and 48 minutes, and uh, which is respectable. Uh, but the, um, but so I mean, you got that enthusiasm, and and uh, 
uh, in the real estate business, which again, I, uh, other than being a top real estate salesman at one time, uh, I don't know much about the business, but no matter what the cycle is, people, there are guys that are the top of the field that are making a million, two million, five million dollars a year. I don't care. Recession, depression, there are people that are moving the ground, moving the houses. And for those that are in the real estate business, there is always somebody moving the, moving property, moving houses, moving buildings. Um, and uh, so as we go through this for the next two and a half days, we'll come back to, and I'll come up with more suggestions, but you will, by definition, grow geometrically. And there's some real estate people here. If that's the industry you're involved in, I talked to Burl Crump, who has owned a very successful real estate company in Canada, sold it, right, Burl? And is still involved uh, more in development now. But I mean, she'd be a good one to talk to because she's been very successful in the same country. I don't know if it's the same province. What province? I'm from Alberta and Burl's from Ontario, but it's not that far. Huh? Okay. There was one other point sure. I'd like to uh, bring to light here again is that you were telling us in San Diego that you are who you hang around with, and you just alluded That's it to issue. just now. And I had the opportunity in the last couple of weeks to invest in the gold mine because I'm thinking bigger, and it's very, very exciting. And another thing uh, to do with the running is I'm thinking about getting sponsored by a large shoe company because I've uh, won my age division in the last three races I've been in. So those are, I'm running That's my great. horizon. That's great. In fact, uh, my wife is a, is a great long-distance runner. Whenever she runs, she runs her age division. She doesn't hardly train. She's never stretched in her life. Anybody that's an athlete, she's never stretched one minute in her life. She doesn't warm down. She just rolls out of the car, takes her sweats off, and goes off and runs 10 or 15 miles, comes back in. She doesn't... She, the, the amount of sweat she has on a 20-mile run is not, does not fill up that. She has a little bead of sweat on the back of her neck. And she, and, but she is... Uh, one of the opportunities I missed and one of the fortunes I missed out on when running first got started, we had an opportunity to buy the first running shoe store in San Vincente in, uh, in, in, um, near Brentwood, where the juice lives. And, the, uh, and I did, decided not to, and that ultimately turned out to be, you know, uh, the most successful running store in the country because running became very vogue in the 70s and early 80s here in the United States. But okay, next. Okay. My name is Mike Roth. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, my big, hairy, monster goal is to have uh, a net worth of $300 million by the time I'm 35 years old. How old are you now? 29. I have a, a business that's working now. Uh, I'm in the publishing business. I've been kind of dinking around for the past year and a half, so I'm getting ready to get serious here. I've been, all my ads are placed. I'm ready to go right now. I brought Jerry and his wife here. To, he's part of my team. And... Um, one of my goals has always been to take a company public. Have no, uh, I'm Easiest a, way to make money, and it's legal. Yep. It's better than robbing banks. Yeah, and I was talking with your, your guy, uh, Ed, about some things uh, before I came here. So I'm here to learn how to, how to steal money legally. It's like Willie Sutton. Elliot Ness says, Willie, Willie, the great bank robber of the 30s. Why do you keep robbing banks? Willie Sutton was arrested by Elliot Ness five or six times in the 30s. And Willie, as the story goes, tell Elliot, Elliot, it's where the money is. I mean, people that don't understand that net worths, fortunes are made on equity and not income. If you learn nothing else, I mean, equity. We have a domestic uh, squabble here already. Good, good, this is good. Uh, one of the things, and I normally don't say this on tape, but I'm going to say it now. This, these seminars or seminars like this that I've given have caused divorces. Because you find you, you come to the sad realization that this person isn't going to go to the next level, or she, she or he. This has caused breakup of partnerships. I see at least one or two smiles in the in the audience. I mean, because if you're going to take this to the nth degree, I mean, if you're going to, you know, like I said, in fact, when I was crying last night listening to my tape about Harvard, I forgot something that I've I've been leaving out the last few months. A saying of mine: If you're going to hunt with the big dogs, you got to get up off the porch. And if you're going to hunt with the big dogs, I mean, a lot of the things that you do now, you're going to realize do not, cannot promote that end result. And um, the, uh, although uh, I, I believe in death before divorce, there are no divorces in my part of the family anyway. There's plenty in the other part, huh, Vince? Plenty of them. But, I mean, it's death before divorce, and you'd read about my wife in the obituary column uh, because, I mean, but... I'm happily married, but I mean, if, you, if your spouse and your partner is not supportive to what you want to do and grow the company, you're going to have a big problem. Now, speaking on, ending on that, give the microphone to the uh, better half of this, this couple, I believe. 
he's upset because I don't like speaking. It's all right. My name is Anna Alvarado. Um, currently, I work for Mervyn's in West Covina. And um, during the day, when I'm not working nights, I, um, I unload trucks. That's what I do. <laughs> um, when I'm not working nights, I work for Jerry. Uh, we own our own uh, laser printer and uh, computer service. We, uh, <laughs> a little louder. We, uh, You're doing fine. Um, all this energy that I'm putting into doing that, I could be doing something else and uh, building up. Jerry's, you should be upset. Building up Jerry's dreams. And Your dreams. I mean, yeah, forget ours, his dreams. Both of ours. Your um, dreams. I want to be able to sit back and spend his money, like, <laughs> like your like your wife is doing. <laughs> That's what I told him on the way over here. I, said, I want to be able to sit back and just spend your money. My wife, my wife will give you lessons on that tomorrow. <laughs> um, that's about it. Okay. Well, what I would do, I mean, um, and this probably doesn't uh, um, interface too well with what your plans are, but uh, I, w I would uh, not work there. And I would see how I could make my laser printing that into the business more productive. Not how, just make it more productive. It, it's funny how necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, I've been fired two or three times in my life. Once by a board of directors at a public company. Uh, once uh, by, um, actually twice by boards of directors. Uh, once of a public company, once of a private company. And once uh, uh, by one of the big Wall Street firms. And um, it made me focus. It made me get laser beam focused to go out and I was able to generate uh, more revenue every time and and uh, the uh, when tough times happen I mean we're forced to make the right decisions almost always and remember I told you about gut instincts almost always being right almost always when we're thrown up against the wall we make the right decision when we get fired when we get laid off when the company closes down whatever we almost always make the right decision and so uh, I would you should be upset. I'd go out and do something different now to enhance what you can do on the other end where you're going to be part of that team, part of that you know, sales unit on an equity basis or on a revenue basis. I'd do it now. I'm, and, and that's hard to say. We're coming up on the holidays. Now, I, rem I know that we're coming up on the holidays. I know it's tough to break up with a husband, a partner, a wife, leave. A I know all that. But then come January 1st, there's going to be some other reason why it's difficult. Oh, my anniversary's coming up, my this. It's, there's never an easy time to do something hard. There never is. I don't care what the hell it is. And uh, it's, um, but when you get used to, uh, you never get completely used to it. Contrary to what people think, you know, when I make, t make, make tough decisions, which, is, which are often, I mean, I don't always like everybody disagreeing with me. But I do it anyway. And so when you get more comfortable with that, just as someday you'll be more comfortable speaking. Um, so I would do all that now. I would just put, a, put together a timetable in my, in, in my own mind and I'd shrink it by 90% and do it now. And, um, but you're, I think you're on the right track. It took a lot more guts than I thought you had there, so I appreciate it. I made you do it for a reason. Um, my name is Jerry Clark, and I own a business here in West Covina, California. Like you, I was fired. And when they fired me, I told them I was going to take over his business. And I did. Not literally yet, but I mean, he's hating me right now. Because, like you said in your little questionnaire, do you pay your employees enough? He didn't pay me enough. Because I was his frontline guy, and I took all the heat, and I saved all his battles. But when it came down to it, he let me go, and I just went to those people, and they said, sure we'll do business with you so i got into this business and now it's been a year and a half and i'm doing okay locally but i got bigger dreams um when i was in san diego you said something that really just like hit me hard and that was you told the, the crowd uh, when you were checking in that there was some guys in front quabbling about a 46 dollar room or something i forgot that yeah yeah <laughs> that was me i would be one of those guys <laughs> quabbling for 46 dollar room and I said, no doubt. And, and one of my dreams is to be able to just never have to worry about a sale, never have to worry about a price tag. I want it, I buy it. And the other dreams to go with that, to get me there,
to make that quantum leap is to work with Mike, be one of the team players, and we want to do in, what, about a year and a half, Mike? Go nationwide. Build that company up. I'm going to build the company up here um, through the help of Mike and then turn around and sell it because I'm going to have to focus, like you said, a couple projects at a time. I don't want to take on more than two. So Anna and I, we're going to work it up, build this business, sell it, and then move over to Phoenix and then try to go nationwide with our business. When you talk in the future, one of the things, that, the, part of this preconditioning is to change the way you talk, change your vocabulary. Not try, you will. And I correct like my, uh, the, the Harvard doofuses, which uh, we, there's one of them still sitting in the audience. And you'd think you would go to Harvard. I mean, when I was a kid, or not when I was a kid, when I was in my early 30s, I, I would have cut my fingers off to have a Harvard education or a Harvard graduate degree. And, and now I realize that it doesn't mean spit, but the, um, you have to change the way you talk. To change the way you talk, you've got to change the way you think. Always talk in the first person. Always talk as if it's already done. It does two things. Number one, it reinforces to you. But more importantly, perception is reality. It reinforces who you're talking to. Like I always say, there's only one time, you only have one time to make a first impression. Okay? When I go, this is my uniform. And can we turn the air conditioner on? I never have to take my jacket. I must be hot in here. Okay. But, I mean, my uniform, you owe it to them to look like a man that they ought to give money to. Now, I said this story in San Diego. I'm going to repeat the $46. Don't sit down. $46 story first. I'm checking into this town and country, which is a dump of a hotel. And, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give a funeral at it myself. But anyway, we're there, and I'm standing in line. You know, there's a queue there. I'm standing there. There's these two old guys. They were saying that, the, well, what's the cheapest room in this room? And if you've got to stand on the second floor, and are you in the east wing or the west wing? And, and to make a long story short, the difference was between 67 and 49 or 67 and $52. And they spent 15 minutes busting the little lady's chomps about it. And I made the talk. When I came in to talk to you uh, people, the people that were there, I said, that's what this is all about. I mean, if you've got to do that, you might as well blow your brains out. Go run in front of a train. I mean... What we're going to talk about over the next two days is I went out and spent money. I went out and joined country clubs. I went out and bought expensive suits because I understood people want to deal with a successful person way before I had the money to do it. Like I tell people now, I have 200 tailor-made suits, 200 to $3,000 suits, 200 times two to 3,000. I got no place to wear them now. Um, you owe it to them to look like a man that they ought to give money to. Now, I said this story in San Diego. I'm going to repeat the $46. Don't sit down. $46 story first. I'm checking into this town and country, which is a dump of a hotel. And, I, I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give a funeral at it myself. But anyway, we're there, and I'm standing in line. You know, there's a queue there. I'm standing there. There's these two old guys. They were saying that, the, well, what's the cheapest room in this room? And if you've got to stand on the second floor, and are you in the east wing or the west wing? And, and to make a long story short, the difference was between 67 and 49 or 67 and $52. And they spent 15 minutes busting the little lady's chomps about it. And I made the talk, when I came in to talk to you uh, people, the people that were there, I said, that's what this is all about. I mean, if you've got to do that, you might as well blow your brains out. Go run in front of a train. I mean, what we're going to talk about over the next few days is I went out and spent money. I went out and joined country clubs. I went out and bought expensive suits because I understood people want to deal with a successful person well, way before I had the money to do it. Like I tell people now, I have 200 tailor-made suits, 200 two to $3,000 suits, 200 times two to 3,000. I got no place to wear them now because I don't, I don't give seminars, but maybe six to 12 times a year. And so, you know, which one, I go through all my suits. Well, which one should I wear this time? And most of them are pinstripe and most of them are three-piece waistcoat. But I had those. I had a lot of them beforehand because you only get to have a, one time to make a first impression. People want to deal with somebody that they feel successful. That's what the yuppies are all about. They haven't really got it right yet, but the little yuppie generation with their little BMWs, that's just it. They're still buying BMWs instead of buying something else. And they all look alike, like little clones, you know, with their little beamers and their little uh, uh, whatever the kind of shoes they wear. And, you know, people want to deal with somebody that's successful. People want to be my partners because I've been successful. And, you know, and they'll want to do business with you if you act, you sound positive, 
you talk like if it's already happened. And believe me, I mean, you'll, it just as the uh, empowerment that you'll have if you start acting as if you had no limits to your abilities and you didn't care what anybody else think, thinks, when you start acting like that, I mean, your business will grow more rapidly. Burl's going to tell a story uh, later today about how she changed the way she dealt with uh, the uh, Royal Bank of Canada. It was like, and she's, a, she's an experienced businesswoman. She's tough. I mean, she's good. But I mean, it was like the whole world changed when her attitude changed with the bank. Instead of coming in on your hands and knees, you know, like you, they just caught you stealing. Okay? Thank you. Sir, we're going down this side. We're going to come back this way. Name, where you're from? I'm uh, Ron Legrand from Florida. And uh, I'm in the information business, uh, real estate related. We do a lot of real estate uh, related uh, seminars, the kind you're not supposed to attend. I said and, there were four or five good ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we do a lot of hands-on training. And, and basically our business is taking people and getting them going and getting them to the plateau and getting them to the point to where we can introduce them to you. Uh, I'm here because our business is on the edge of that quantum uh, leap that we're talking about. We're doing uh, nationwide conferences and trainings of all kinds, and we deal with real people. We screen our speakers pretty well and our trainers. But our problem right now is we have so much to do that um, these are being focused is our biggest problem. I know what the problem is. I hope maybe uh, you can help us uh, work on that. And finding the right people to put in place to make that happen and um, trying to think macro instead of uh, micro. I just met Dan in San Diego at uh, what they called a conference over there. And I, I've only... I, <laughs> You, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never even heard of Dan Pena until I was uh, there and I saw him speak. And uh, he, he's my kind of guy. I thought I, they, uh, the people called me brutal till I met him. <laughs> uh, uh, and I'm just almost as modest as he is as well. <laughs> anyway, that's why we're here. And I hope we're going to be working with uh, Ed, Ed back there some. And uh, we're just here looking for that quantum growth. We're looking for that door that Dan was talking about, really. Let, let, let me comment uh, on a couple of things that you've said. Number one, uh, you're right. I mean, if, you said that you're having trouble focusing because you're probably doing more than two or three things. You're, you're in two, more than two or three businesses. What I, and, 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 uh, what I would do is find, there's two ways to do this. You find the two or three that are making you the most money, and then you find the two or three that have the most potential but aren't making you the money, and you specifically focus, you as an individual, on the ones, the two or three that have the biggest potential to make you the money, and you deal with that, and you turn the two or three over that are making you the money to your, your capable staff. Actually, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm in one business, it's just that this business has so many, many profit centers okay, in it. Okay, but yes. I mean, find the two or three profit centers that you're doing the best, and then find the two or three profit centers that could be the best, but for whatever reason you don't understand why they're not. Then you focus in on the two or three profit centers that should be the best but aren't, and you allow your people to run, let your profits run on the two or three. I'm looking, I'm a firm believer in finding the right people and building a business around them, and we're in a real strong search for those people because we're growing so fast that um, it's all I can do to keep up with the growth, much less get involved with all the little junk. And that's something that I have to fight all the time is thinking macro like or micro like you were talking about it's something i have to work on every single day uh, well about part the of the key problem. to that success or g gaining success with that problem is being able to delegate and 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 you're going to delegate sometimes to people that aren't as capable as you thought they were but you don't find out until you make the mistake so you've got to delegate to those people like i you know like uh, rick's rick scott does he may lets them allow allows his people the several hundred people make million dollar decisions we all know there's got to be a lot of mistakes in those. But he weeds those guys and gals out quickly. And then what he does is the people are, that are left, he gives them more responsibility and more responsibility. Now, I haven't talked to him in two or three years, but I, I hear he's got some people that are making 20, 50, 100 million dollar decisions now that started out as a million dollar because you allow them to hopefully not uh, find their Peter principle. We all have our Peter principle. But you allow them to go up and, and take as much responsibility and as much authority as they can swallow. And, but what I've found, when you're trying to build and you've got a large staff, 
because you're trying to be so careful to find the right people, you wind up not putting enough people rubber hitting the ground. And so what I've done and what other high performance people in similar industries, they make the decisions quicker, but they turn the people over quicker. I mean, you know, how long does it take you to find out if the guy or gal is good or bad? How long does it take? A few minutes. Okay. And I and I, and, and uh, unfortunately that will you'll see some turnover in the initial months, but then after that's over, you've got a foundation that you can build upon and move forward to get your quantum leap. And one of our biggest problems is, is finding the people that have the knowledge to put in the place to begin with because, um, for instance, I'm looking to build a direct marketing arm and I'm also looking to build a telemarketing arm and, I, and the person that we put in those places have to know more about it than I do. And uh, I'm, I'd like to discuss that with you when I get a chance and, and maybe I'm on the wrong track here. But well, no, they, they the right should. People. If they don't know more than you and if you're not in a telemarketing expert or, well, I mean, something's wrong. If they don't know more than me, I don't want them. That's exactly right. And, and virtually everybody that's part of my team, by definition, knows geometrically more than I do about the various aspects of the business. You know, I'm considered a litigious person. And one of my partners is here who's a, a litigator. And uh, I've been involved in over 200 lawsuits, 214. I've won them all. I've never lost one in the United States. Now, I'm, I'm pretty um, savvy litigator. That's about, you know, but that's, that's about all I know because I've been through so many lawsuits, you know. I know when to slap them with this and when to do this and when to do that, only because I've, you know, like Pavlov's dog could figure it out. I've done it so many times. Tim, I'm not trying to say that you're Pavlov's dog. Yeah, it's, uh, but um, so go steal somebody. Go, who's in your business? I will steal them. That's where I get my yeah, best folks. Yeah, I mean, go to, go to whoever and acquire them from whoever you admire or whoever's got a good operation like that acquire them. That's what I did. I acquired people that were in organizations where they were as successful as I knew that I could be, but I wasn't yet. And I acquired people from those Either organizations. Either that or we'll just go acquire the organization. Absolutely. Next step. I never even thought about that until I met you. Okay. The next step is to acquire the organization. You know, they call me an acquisition guy because I've made a lot of acquisitions. But even small businesses, small to medium-sized businesses, you can go take out your competitor. You'd be, you'd be surprised how low their expectations are. And sometimes, most times, you can buy them out cheaper than you could build it. So I'm here to, for you to teach us how to do it. Okay, that. we will. Okay, very good. Next, sir. I'm Emerson Brantley. I'm the marketing director for the Legrand Group, Franz Group. And uh, I'm here with Ray Rock, uh, all, all three of us from the Legrand Group. Uh, my initial reason for coming here was to help me start to see better the marginal changes to make our marketing efforts more successful, um, smarter, not harder. Uh, as I was working on the questionnaire, though, I began to realize that even though I've been a person for years that worked with goals and had goals ahead of myself, had them clearly thought out, somewhere along the way, my own uh, personal goals have become muddy. And uh, one of the things that I will come out of this with is a very clear, defined set for my own personal, of my own personal goals, and uh, along with uh, some, along with some insights on making those marginal shifts for the quantum growth for our business goals, I found our business goals were a lot easier for me to, to put down. It, uh, two things: one, the reason that he's had this muddy side on his personal is because he has been devoted to the business. That's good for you. That's good. I, I, I like those kind of uh, challenges, problems. On a personal side, that you will be able to be better part of a team if you're growing yourself geometrically with your own goals. You know, um, the, I used to be, be, say that I, I, you know, I, I, may, I made more millionaires than anybody in the energy business, uh, guys that work for me and, and gals. Uh, but the, the better that I help them fulfill their own dreams, the better they work for me in the organization. And, uh, and, and when you come the end of the third day and you start putting the stuff into practice, when you have been able to develop your own scheme of what you want out of, uh, out of this seminar going forward, you'll be able to react as part of the group in a much, much forceful way. So and my so, goal should be to make these guys millionaires, huh? Absolutely. I'll write that down. Yeah. They wrote it down. Don't worry. They didn't forget. <laughs> yeah. Ron, Ron was touched by God this week. Yeah. Very good. Close. Yeah. 
Bob, just what? What? Can you take like a five minute break, please? Why are you like that? Okay. Okay, five minutes. I have to say modestly, I don't know anybody in the country who knows how to do it better than me. So okay. that's doing this business. I know a number of guys that probably know better than me, Ross Perot and a few guys, but they're not in this business. So, but I mean, I know how to do that. And the, um, and the thing I like about this, and I don't know other than I, you know, Ed's talked to me about you, but you've, you've, you've got a team put together and you brought a team here. That's critically important because for the head guy or gal to come back all fired up full of piss and vinegar and none of his people to understand what the hell's going on and none of them to understand the language, the buzzwords is not good if you want it to succeed. The way, the best way is to have the key people because it's like I say, you know, um, that's why Christ had disciples. He had what, 12, right? 12, and then they ran out, and then, you know, yeah, 12. And that's why we call them dan dance disciples. I mean, and, uh, and they go out and they teach, and they be, they're the mentors to another 10 or 12 or 6 or 8 or whatever the number is. And so that's, that's good. I mean, a lot of times you see people not bring the people, the key people that are important to their organization. You want to say something? I got a story that relates to this class and really is presses strong on what you're talking about. This is not a good, I'm not proud of this story, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. I would like to have my daughter here, who is a key in our company, and I would like to have her husband here, who is new in our company, and I would like to have my wife here. My wife has no interest in what we're doing here. Uh, by the way, my wife has a black belt in shopping, Dan. <laughs> I gave it to her in a seminar. Yeah, yeah. It says, uh, it's a big black belt. It says shopping, embroidered right on the front of it. Embarrassed the hell out of her. Anyway, the reason that uh, my daughter and my son-in-law aren't here is because they're going to be over in Vegas babysitting my wife. So, so because we had Vegas scheduled before I met Dan, and I, de I decided on the spot that I was going to come here. And I decided that uh, you know, these folks... On the spot. On the spot. On the spot. On the okay. spot. That I was going to come here, and so basically I just had to work around that. I've been married for 29 years. I uh, have eight grandchildren, and I have no plans to change that. It's just that my wife is not in there working with me, but she does not stand in my way. Sometimes I guess we have to make concessions. But I would love to have my daughter here and, and her husband at the very least. But because of that family, but next time. Next time. And that's something we're going to talk about. A big phrase I use is next time. When you're chewing people out, you know, don't chew them out because they know they made a mistake, and I always say next time. In Scotland. That's all very good, in Scotland, absolutely. And, 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 and the thing that's important, he said instantly he knew he wanted to do this. We all have that same feeling, but we fight it. But we fight it. Now, he's, you know, he's already said that he's a pretty braggadocious guy himself. He obviously, you know, he's not afraid. He's made plenty of mistakes like I have, but he's not afraid to make a decision. High-performance people make decisions. And they're, they're not afraid of their consequences because they know they're going to be right more than they're wrong. And that's the, the biggest difference between high-performance people, or one of the biggest differences, not the biggest difference, between a high-performance person and everybody else. And, uh, the, uh, and, but he knows enough through experience to know to bring his key people. He wanted his daughter to be here. I've had guys and ladies come back. They brought their grandchildren. I mean, the youngest... Uh, that I've ever had was I had two 14 year olds one young kid from Chicago named Lou who started Northwestern University at age 16 and another young girl named Cochran from uh, near Electra, Texas uh, Jerry uh, was a population of about 2,000 people and she was there because uh, her grandfather was leaving her a lot of money who was also in the audience he wasn't dead yet but I know that I have to be educated on what to do with this money and what kind of people to hire so I'll, because I've got a big portfolio, or I'm going to have a big portfolio pretty soon. And I looked at the old man. He didn't look that old, uh, like he was ready to die. But he says, and so I've had young people come, but it's important. Of course, my kids, uh, I, I probably told the story. I, I, I gave a big speech in front of six or 7,000 people a couple years ago, and CBS was interviewing my oldest son, and they said, well, what would you think of that? I've heard this all my life. I mean, what's new? And then he said off camera, the five credo crap. We haven't gotten into the five credos yet. The five credo crap. So, I mean... But it, you're right. Your your daughter and uh, your son-in-law should be exposed to this, and uh, and bring your wife to the castle. I mean, I think I can get a go. For oh that. yeah, well, she'll like that. Oh, yeah. She'll like that. Okay, who's got the mic? Right here. 
Yes. Testing, testing. Does this work? Can you hear me back there? With the mic? Okay, maybe it is working. I can't hear the, uh, the after effect. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jose Castillo. I'm originally from Texas. I've been out here in California about 14 years, and I own a computer company here in the San Fernando Valley that I'm hoping to liquidate sometime next year. In the last 30 days, I've made a couple of decisions, uh, ventures that I'm going to go into. One of them is down in Texas, should be a development company, and then one's going to be down in Mexico buying and selling into Mexico with co uh, contacts that I have in the East and also in California. Uh, the other area that I'm going into is I've started a nonprofit organization to promote entrepreneurship amongst all ethnics um, using my computer background. I'm the computer nerd that you're talking about. I've got a computer science degree and I have an MBA degree, not from Harvard, but close by. Bad combination. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. But uh, the hope is to apply the technology and apply my background and apply my contacts into a couple of growing businesses that I'm getting into. Uh, the company that I own now that I've had for 14 years is uh, computer based in the San Fernando Valley with uh, contacts throughout Southern California. But I will be selling that company hopefully by the first quarter of 1995 and moving into the real estate development area down in Texas and also into the import-export business. You will sell it, remember? Not hopefully sell no, no. it, you will the sell it. The decision's already made. I went through the entrepreneur program at USC, so I've, I've already developed an exit on how to get out. Uh, I'm going to develop a similar company with the same concept down in Texas for about two years, and then I'll sell that one and move on to the other one. I'm hoping that the organization that I started, the nonprofit, that will expose me to other entrepreneurs will allow me to buy and sell businesses through those contacts in the different eth by the different ethnics. Well, you know, let me comment. One of the reasons I give seminars other than I like it is it's the conduit of transactions for me. I mean, this year I will do two or three deals, all of which came through my seminars. As dupus as you might think you are, occasionally a, a blind hog gets an acorn. And when, if, if you don't bring that acorn to me, you are a moron. I mean, because I don't, you don't know anybody that can get the deal done better or quicker or for sure than me. And so that's one of the reasons I do this as your nonprofit will bring you transactions. That's one of the reasons I do these seminars, and uh, I only plan on doing two or three a year, and uh, this year we will have hit, hit that goal, but that's why I do this, because it, it allows me without running around, you know, uh, the, the, all these deals, you know, admittedly most of the deals aren't any good, and I tell the people that they shouldn't be dealing in them, but occasionally that there are, there is a good deal, and what, what I would s submit to you is that the, uh, you said two very critically important things. You said, one, that you wanted to start the business and roll out of it in two years. There's a time to sell every damn business in the world, and most of us don't know when opportunity knocks. We figure out that we want to sell the business five years after the cycle's over. My recommendation, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to talk about extra strategies on su Saturday. My recommendation is, if you're over the age of 40, the next cycle in your business, up cycle, sell. If you're over the age of 40, I don't care if it comes when you're 41 or 55, sell. Because you may not be in that business long enough to hit another cycle. And we all have this pride of authorship we hang on too long. It's like a fighter or a baseball player that winds up embarrassing himself in the ring or on the field. Because it's tough to sell because we say, what are we going to do? Well, it's, it's a lot easier or better to be trying to decide what you're going to do with a pocket full of money than it is without a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. Yes. And I mean, so that, I mean, he, he understands that, and that's good. But see, and, and, and these transactions that I get involved in now that are brought to me, it was the idea to roll them. And I don't say necessarily in one to three years. I roll them when the time's right. If it's one day after I bought the son of a gun, I'll roll it doesn't make any difference you got to know when to sell you got to know when to bluff you got to know when to hold your cards and you got to know when to play them and, and 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 it's a learned process next Bruce hi Bruce Whipple audit cost international uh, I first met Dan in 1993 and uh, we've enjoyed an awful lot of success since that time we're in a business a consulting business we, uh, on a contingency basis, reduce school and property taxes, mostly for Fortune 500 companies. And that really was something that happened <clears throat> after we got together with Dan. To, we had some success, which was good. Uh, Dan very definitely, and something you'll hear this weekend, said, you know, focus on that success. Let that run its course. Focus on the many, uh, or not, the few, not the many. 
And if most of your revenue has come out of the large companies, why not just do that exclusively? So we did that. And in the last year, we've saved our clients a little better than $12 million on an annual basis. Uh, I thought I had a big goal to grow this to a $100 million company. Uh, after talking to Dan, that goal is uh, now far exceeded, and, uh, and we'll end up doing that. And one of the things that and Dan and I will talk about this tonight is absolutely what he said is that with the success comes a lot of problems, which is good. And, you know, we're in the process now of going through some things that uh, will be tough to get through, but you've got to get through that to get on to the next step, which is where we are now. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bruce now, and I obviously have much more knowledge about his business than anybody else's business here. And he's at a, he's at a crossroads, and it's where everybody in the company isn't thinking the same down the same road. So there has to be some changes, and that's what he's uh, alluded to. But one of the things that when I first met him, he had had IBM, I believe, as a client, and uh, it wasn't important if you got him by luck, design, brains. You know, they 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 fell over you. But I mean, not many people. IBM is very strict who they do business with. You have to be a quality company. You have to have financial integrity. All these things. And, and, and I said that you should leverage off of that and go after Fortune 50 or Fortune 100 companies. And he's added to his portfolio of companies, I don't know, a dozen or so of the big uh, Fortune 50, Fortune 100 type companies. But one of the things I tell the people that are in sales or in marketing is that most people, if they turn, less, turn loose their prospect list totally, if you haven't closed somebody in 90 days, you can take the prospect and you can take it and you, you know the tidy bowl man and how he hangs on the toilet bowl there and you throw it right down with the tidy bowl man because if you're not going to unless you're talking about 100 200 500 million dollar sales which i've made those too then that's the only caveat i have but if you haven't gotten a letter of intent or something out of him in 90 days normally 30 but 90 days my when i tell insurance salesmen this they go nuts when i tell real estate salesmen this, they go nuts how can i turn this to my prospect that's my lifeblood. But I mean, see, it's easier to go have lunch with a prospect you've had for three years than it is to develop a new one. I mean, a new one requires a cold call. And you're butt puckering up when the guy, you know, may say no. And so, but I mean, you gotta kiss a lot of frogs. You gotta make a lot of calls. You gotta see a lot of people. In my particular case, I don't necessarily make all the calls. Somebody makes them for me, but I still see a lot of people. And I've been out, I used to have an administrative assistant who hopefully is going to come here on Saturday. He's a young 23-year-old man uh, that uh, saw me at the same seminar we met a year and a half ago. And he came up to me and he said, could I come to work for you for a year for free? I said, get away, kid, you bother me. And then, but he was persistent, so we had lunch. And then he was geographically close to where I lived. And so, make a long story short, he worked for me for 11 months and, uh, and two weeks for free. And he expanded his knowledge tremendously, and then he and, and he went off and he started his own business, and he hopefully will be here Saturday. But he we attend all these meetings. He said, "Why are you talking to these morons?" I said, "You got to talk to a lot of morons before you find somebody that's worth talking to. You got to kiss a lot of frogs, and you got to put your lips on their pussy backs with the lumps and the war. You know, you got to kiss a lot of frogs. Now, a lot of you connote that to kiss a lot of ass, and you're." Too much a man or too much a woman to kiss ass. Well, if I can kiss ass, ladies and gentlemen, there's not a swinging dick in this room. Excuse me, ladies. There's not a swinging dick in this room that doesn't shouldn't kiss ass. If Dan Penny can kiss ass with my money, you sure as hell can kiss ass. So, I mean, I kiss a lot of frogs. I talk to a lot of people. You know, my kids even come in and listen. When, the, when I had the, originally the Magnificent Seven, these Harvard doofuses come to my house, and, and my, my, one of my sons came in and listened, you know, the, after the kids left, the kids, they're a young man between t roughly 26 and 31 or something like that. And my, my, my oldest son, Dan Jr., says, why are you wasting time with these guys? These guys don't know anything. In fact, I used to tell the, the Harvard kids, I'll put my former administrative assistant, who's 33, who hasn't finished Pepperdine yet, yet Pepperdine University yet, and my oldest son, who's not quite 13, and they will eat your collective seven guys lunch with all your Harvard MBAs and law degrees. And I still believe that. And because they haven't got the experience. Now they're smarter. I mean, all of the uh, seven, they're not all seven. One of them's here, and then there's a group of four that have split off. But it's about kissing frogs. I need to meet with 26-year-old kids like I need AIDS. <laughs> what am I possibly gonna learn? Nothing. I don't care if he's the, uh, the smartest 26-year-olds 
in the history of mankind. But I do that. Now, a transaction or two, one of them's gonna, like I told, uh, one of them knows the um, uh, ghost writer for, uh, well, the one, he's sitting here, ghost writer for Rush Limbaugh. Because I've been talking to, to negotiating with various uh, ghost writers to write a book about uh, my exploits or my infamous exploits. And if I hadn't kissed this lumpy frog, and he's got a lot of warts, he's getting ready to talk too. He's got pus ridden warts all over him. I mean, I wouldn't have, without a lot of hard work, been a, be able to be exposed to Rush Limbaugh's ghostwriter, who I want to meet. So, and but if I can get out there and kiss a lot of, voice, pardon? And there's a hint of surprise in your voice. Yes, yeah, a hint of surprise. And if I, so if I'm kissing frogs, there's no reason why every man and woman in this, in this room, Jerry Orman looks at more deals at the back of the room. Jerry, is it right if I tell him how old you are? Aren't you about 75 now? Okay, 75 years old. He probably looks at more deals than, other than me, than anybody in this room. He's been, he's, he lives up in Bel Air on, uh, around the corner from Conrad Hilton, and I mean, he's rich. I mean, and he's looking at deals all the time. I mean, if he can do it, I mean, there's no reason why anybody in this room shouldn't be looking at opportunities all the time. And that's the difference between high performance people and everybody else. They look at opportunities all the time. Okay, um, Bruce, would you go? Uh, you know, you're more comfortable with a microphone uh, than most, so tell them who you are, where you're from. <laughs> with all humility. It's um, on. Thanks. I'm a 27-year-old uh, Harvard doofus. <laughs> and uh, one of the magnificent seven, which became kind of the terrible threesome and all the way down the line. Um, we met Dan several weeks ago, where he brought us in, unbeknown to us, uh, and sat us down in our living room, his living room. It's not ours yet. Yeah, I, would, I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go to your living room. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, he proceeded to tell us exactly as he said there, how much we didn't know, how much we still had to know, and how the worst mistake we could ever make was thinking that what we learned in an Ivy League school somehow prepared us for the real world, and that would be the death of us. Uh, we didn't know we were entertaining him and his children after we were gone, but I, that makes sense. Uh, for now, I'm a writer, an author, and a radio talk show host here in Los Angeles on the new ABC station, 710 Talk. I host a radio show there uh, for young people, for 20-somethings, at night. Uh, my book, my, I guess the first deal that I ever cut out of college, I was 23 years old when I sold um, my college story to Bantam Books. I wrote a book about my experience being a Mexican-American student at Harvard. Uh, I've written 30 editorials for the Los Angeles Times, and now I host this radio show 15 hours a week. So that was Dan's reference to this microphone. Um, the thing that I, I am realizing I'm excited about is as things change and as we change and as California changes, certainly the debate has changed and the issues has changed. I, I deal in communications, I deal in information. My job is to interpret what's going on outside, whether it's in Proposition 187's debate or anything like that, to the people who either listen to the radio, read the paper, or buy my book. And after they've gotten that information, you sell, you sell them some Snapple in the commercial break and they go on their way. Everybody's happy. ABC's happy, Bantam Books is happy, Harvard was happy. They'd be a lot ha happier if I paid off my loan. And, uh, and, and, the, and the Los Angeles Times is happy. And the reason they're, they're happy is because there are very few in the United States, Mexican Americans, Latinos who do what I do, uh, like I do it. And to that end, I, I'm able to, to contribute something to the, the overall debate. If I have any kind of a role model or any kind of a prototype of people who came before me, it would be someone like Rush Limbaugh who's effective in the television medium, the radio medium, the print medium, a newsletter medium, and when you put them all together, this one-man band makes $20 million disseminating misinformation or information, depending on your perspective. Um, the thing that I, I liked when I was, during lunch, I had a chance to listen to Dennis Prager's show. Dennis Prager is another person who does a lot of those different mediums on KBC, the older talk station in town. Uh, they're both owned by, by ABC. And Dennis uh, was talking about Proposition 187 in Mexico or something, and Dennis is a very intelligent guy who, again, this one-man band, 
makes about two or three million dollars a year spinning all these different plates at the end of sticks. But he got it wrong. Dennis was today on the radio at one point dead wrong about some facet of the immigration debate. And I'm half Dennis's age, but I know in my heart and in my head that he's wrong. And tonight on my show, I'll say that he's wrong. And what I find unique about that as a 27-year-old is that as smart as Prager is and as much money as Prager makes, there's something I bring to the table by virtue of who I am and the, experience of, the experiences I've had up to this point. So uh, it's, it's reaffirming. The best call I got this week, we were doing a show on homework, or maybe it was last week, and just to, to tell you that I'm constantly learning, constantly challenged, there was a, we were doing a show on homework, and there was a kid who was 12 years old who called our show. It just blew my mind that a 12-year-old would first be listening to talk radio, and second would call a talk radio show. Okay? <laughs> Uh, this kid's scary. This kid is probably horribly screwed up given the fact that he's listening to talk radio at 12. But he's sitting there at his computer in his email, who knows what, and he's going to comment on this thing. His name was Max, and Max uh, haunts me to a certain degree because I am dying to know what makes Max tick. Max isn't even part of my generation. He's so young. If I'm a 20-something, he's the generation that comes after me. So I'm going to spend now the next... Um, year or so as I develop more book projects and TV shows and radio shows, trying to get a fix on Max and all of Max's friends. So that can be that much ahead of the curve, because it doesn't do me any good to know what my colleagues are thinking as 20-somethings. Uh, that, was, that was challenging to a point. I really want to figure out what makes Max tick. And that's it. Max, um, Max says he does a lot of homework. and. Uh, he had, uh, we were, I guess we were talking about a proposal up in Half Moon Bay to get rid of homework, and that whole debate, it, it had started. And uh, Max's perspective was that, you know, he's doing his homework, and he's obedient, he's a good kid, but uh, he wished the teachers were more efficient in terms of streamlining the, the homework. Because in the, they've always given, as long as they've been teachers, they've been teachers who give students busy work, just to keep them busy. The difference is that Max is 12 years old, and Max knows better than I knew when I was 12 what busy work is. <laughs> When I was 12, I just did it. I didn't know if it was busy work or important well, like work or whatever. Well, my kid, don't do it. I mean, see? Yeah. Well, he's already heard this comment. Uh, I, 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 I had dinner with him not too long ago, and I told him that, uh, that he had the gift to gab. He had the gift um, to, uh, in a fairly articulate way, vis-a-vis uh, -vis how old he is, get a point across. And although I've only heard him on the radio one, one time, and that was by accident, the, uh, he, I said that he, he can make a lot of money because when I was a, a young sales manager going to graduate school and I remember uh, uh, my boss, uh, I disbarred Bolt Hall, which is Berkeley's law school, lawyer tell me, Dan, as long as they don't cut your tongue out, you're going to be rich someday. You can stay out of jail. I mean, and, and, and uh, this young man, uh, notwithstanding his Harvard education, is, is, is had a lot of success for his age, and, uh, but I told him that to, to not be, uh, uh, lose focus on what he does well, and he should continue. I don't know how good his book is. He gave it to me. I just thumbed through it. I, read, I, I can read 6,000 words a minute uh, when I want to, which isn't very often, but I, I read his book in about seven or eight minutes, hmm. and, uh, the, uh, uh, and I'm not 20-something anymore, and I don't consider myself a minority, so even though my name is Pena, so a lot of what he had to write, I couldn't relate to. But uh, that, you know, I'm not his market. But um, so I've told him how to stay focused and in the media uh, that he can flap his lips. Uh, and to the extent that he can develop his writing skills, that's fine. He may already have them. I, I'm not the greatest judge of that. But um, because people like Rush uh, have you know, has developed a, 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 I don't know if a corner on the market is right, but I mean, he, 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 he's got a, a niche, and it goes to prove there are a lot of people that you wouldn't have thought before the Rush Limbaugh um, era thought like Rush. He's got a following that you wouldn't believe. And although I'm at that end of the continuum myself, I, I don't listen to Rush that often on, on, on the, the radio or TV, and I've tell, told him basically to develop that niche and stay and uh, stay to the knitting, his knitting, and stay to what he knows and understands, and he, he'll make a lot of money. He'll make a lot of money. Next, sir. 
My name is Brian Lowe. I'm from Los Angeles. I'm a medical doctor. I specialize in rehabilitation. Um, most doctors, they make comfortable livings, but the ones that do really well, they invest their money, and I thought, you know, a business is, you know, your best investment. So I'm here so that you can rip off from me so I develop your mindset. Uh, about three months ago, I started a vending machine business, some small machines and some small businesses. It takes a fair amount of time. It doesn't produce very much money. You'd probably vomit if you saw it. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> Before I walk away from it, because I was considering even just walking away from it and dumping it. And That's your initial gut instinct? Yeah. You're probably right. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I'd be walking away from $30,000, I mean. A doctor, but. I mean, that's <laughs> it's a couple of slices. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, before I walk away from it, I was thinking, if I can make this business work, you know, and be successful, the, the things I would learn in this business, I could probably apply to any business. So I was thinking maybe I could use whatever I learned from you and make this successful before I, you know, walk away from that. Okay. Three things off the top of my head. One, if you thought, think you ought to walk away, you probably should. Two, if you're not going to walk away, I find some young uh, uh, budding entrepreneur, give it to him, keep 40% or something, let him run with it. You'll, still, you'll learn through, through his mistakes. You don't have to do them yourself. Okay, that's good. Uh, or uh, the third least attractive is for you to have to do it yourself. And... Uh, and the um, and I, I don't I don't find that as a viable alternative. I mean, it's one of the two: either walk away or turn it over to somebody else. Uh, uh, there's some businesses in this room that are being run that I control by run by young men, and uh, I will learn through their mistakes. I don't need any more mistakes. I don't need any more any more uh, experience vis-a-vis -vis that. But uh, I mean, although we'll go back and we'll develop a, a, a different, perhaps a slightly different point of view as the days or the hours go by, but. Um, your instincts were probably correct, your initial instincts. Thanks. Okay. My name is Craig Hoffman, and I live in Rolling Hills, down the street from Dan, where I guess the air is a little thin. Um, <laughs> Dan and I uh, became, well, I don't know what to say friends yet, but we've known each other, I don't know, eight or more years we met through our wives and uh, I guess I'm one of Dan's friends who he doesn't give a damn about unless he wants to earn some money on the golf course <laughs> and if he could putt he would have probably been able to accomplish that um, I'm president and owner of a uh, Southern California regional restaurant chain I have 12 restaurants and do about 30 million dollars a year in sales and Dan is always busting my butt uh, when we're playing golf, tell me I should do something with, with my measly little company. So I thought no, I... No, with your measly little life. Uh, <laughs> and my measly little life. So anyway, I've come here to uh, learn the wisdom from uh, Dan. Uh, i get back to the business dream a little bit. Uh, my dream is to uh, uh, start a new restaurant venture, uh, take it public, and uh, develop it nationwide into a chain doing... Two hundred fifty million dollars, and I, that's my goal. Um, Craig and I have known each other a number of years, and um, he's been to my home in Scotland. And um, his better half isn't here this afternoon, Mary. Uh, and uh, the um, and I do continue to bust his jaw about, you know, uh, his, his business and how he could run a, a much uh, larger organization. He's a hands-on manager. He's a micro guy, and hopefully, at uh, the end of this um, this process, uh, he, not hopefully, he will have the knowledge to be a macro guy. And uh, because in the industry, as far as I can tell, I mean, there are not many people that run uh, restaurants more efficiently than he does. So, um, and he's right. If I could putt better, that's why I put a putting green in. You know, you know, I, 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 built, I built my own golf center in the backyard so I can become a better putter. But, um, Michael. Hello, my name is Michael Wan. I live in San Marino, California. And I own a marketing firm, which is related with the uh, communication, uh, telecommunication related products. And uh, my dream is uh, build Asian on uh, telecommunication company in this country. The next step will be uh, take it to the public, like what uh, Mr. Dan Pena said. 
So I'm here for learning how to uh, uh, mm, uh, how to jump to uh, to the public company and use my background, which is the uh, all Asian community. We have a few million people here, and I think we can make it this one. Uh, I hope I can learn uh, something from him here today. Thank you. Michael and I have worked together. Uh, we uh, I've worked with him on this te uh, Asian telecommunication company, and uh, we're still continuing to pursue it. Uh, his forte is uh, is on, on the marketing end of the telecommunication, both through uh, telemarketing and direct sales. And um, the uh, this is the first opportunity he's had to come and listen to me. Although we've dealt for several months, and we've um, come very close to putting a couple of deals together, which is important, uh, important aspect or important thought. Everything I touch, everything I do doesn't come to fruition. It doesn't come to fruition because I didn't try to uh, make sure it did come to fruition, but high performance people realize that to hit a home run, to hit a grand slam, you got to be up at the plate. Not only do you have to be up at the plate, you can't watch them throwing, uh, uh, you know, aspirins by, uh, you know, fastballs. You got to swing at the plate. Now, I've swung at the telecommunication play two or three times in the last year, and uh, I've struck out, you know, all three times. And I came very, I've come very close to uh, acquiring controlling interests of uh, a couple telecommunication company, one in San Diego, but for whatever reason, either the FCC or they were so far into bankruptcy, or which normally is because when you come in to look at a business, they tell you all, all the puff. By the time you get to, down to the shit and find out you can't save it, You've spent six months and, you know, in my case, a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know. And so, but you keep on looking. You keep on kissing those frauds, you know. It's like the guy, I've got a friend of mine in New York. I saw him stand on 55th and, uh, I can't remember the cross street now. And he asked about 50, 60 women if he'd, they'd go to sleep with him. About 20 of them slapped him. Some of them said obscenities. But finally one said, yes, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. Now, this guy is the preeminent frog kisser of New York City. His name is Walter Levine. I'm going to say it, Walter. You know, and he's, he's, uh, he's uh, recovering from uh, bone marrow cancer. And uh, the, um, after his wife hears this, if she does, she'll probably hope that he doesn't recover. But, I mean, I saw it with my own eyes. I'd always heard that if you did that, well, I'm a believer now. And no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. And um, the, um, but uh, so you've got to continue. We've, we've continued to look at telecommunication deals, and I don't like all the money I've spent on due diligence and all these other things investigating. But I mean, I, I, I feel that there's two industries that are in chaos right now one is telecommunications, and one is healthcare. And Rick Scott, my former lawyer, has got healthcare not tied up, but I mean, he's got a 15, 16 billion dollar head start, so I'm not an idiot. And I mean, he's at least as smart as me. We, we did a lot of deals together, so I'd rather go into telecommunication where you got more, oh, I, sh I shouldn't say more, where you got people like the vice president flapping his lips about, you know, the superhighway and all this, I mean. And you've got, uh, you know, the, uh, the government saying that the baby bells and the large telecommunication companies can't own this and can't do that. Boy, that's great when you got that kind of interference from the government. I mean, because a lot of money is going to be made. That's why he went into the health care, because he thought that that was in chaos. The biggest fortunes are made in industries that are in chaos, that things are going wrong. Those are where the biggest opportunities are. So uh, Michael and I have worked on two or three things, um, and we will continue to. Uh, where's the mic? Sir. My name's Jim Kennedy, and, uh, and I'm from Brea, California, which is about an hour south of here. And... Um, Prior to doing what, I was, what I'm doing now, I was in the automotive repair business for 17 years. And now I sell automotive repair manuals to the garages and the gas stations and the dealerships. And I'm uh, an independent distributor for a company in Detroit. And this business provides me with a good middle, come, middle, middle class income. Um, but, but I'm at a dead end. It's, I'm lim limited because I've got what they call a protected territory. I can't go outside my territory. And so, you know, I finally realized this about three years ago, and so I've been, I started looking around, looking around for something else, always looking for something else to do. And, and I saw you in San Diego three weeks ago, 
and um, got a, a glimpse of thinking bigger and came home with the idea, that the dream that uh, you, you, you name the figure, in, in 10 years I want to have assets worth $420 million. And in my looking around, I found something I think that, that uh, I could acquire that with this thing that I found. And it's, um, it's a device aimed at a specific niche group. And I'm a member of that group. And there's several million of us throughout the country. And, uh, and it's uh, a safety device for um, the group that I'm in. I'm, I'm an amputee. I lost my leg when I was 18 below the knee. And so this is it's a safety device for amputees of my my, my type, and it's something that I think could uh, make me wealthy. And so I've contacted this company. I found it, found the device. I was on a cruise in the Caribbean, and I went and saw this thing. And I, when I came, came home, I looked around, looked around, looked around. I found a device almost exactly the same. And I contacted the manufacturer, and they said that... Uh, that I'm not a distributor of theirs, that I had to contact one of their distributors. So I did, locally here. And um, so they said they're going to set up a discount structure for me so I could buy this and market it. And that's where I'm at right now. Well, two things. One, uh, people that, you know, uh, uh, that um, have it like, uh, I don't like to use the word disability, uh, disadvantaged, uh, normally can get passionate about something that directly affects them. Um, uh, I have a, a very dear friend that I uh, went to school with, and uh, uh, she uh, was in a skiing accident, and she had basically this much of her cut off up to the hip and her leg. And to make a long story short, she became a CPA, and, uh, the, uh, and she is involved in a lot of very passionate uh, businesses that have to do with amputees. And... Uh, um, Number two, you, you have two or three million or one or two million people that could benefit from this, and they're going to listen to somebody that suffers or has the same affliction or disadvantage as they do. So that's, that's a lock, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis what you want to do. Now, as far as the, the marketing and the, you know, you've got to go through the distributor, somehow you have to overcome that, either go directly to the president of the company, find somebody that knows the president of the company, uh, uh, and find somebody that uh, can relate that story that you're going to be more effective because you have the same disadvantages that you're selling to. Uh, go line up five or six sales or distribu uh, distribution centers for them and then come to the president. Hey, listen, the reason why you ought to listen to me is because I've already got this, 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 and this lined up. And I mean, irrespective of what his general manager, sales manager, marketing director, anybody else, a lawyer tells him, I mean, this guy's got a bunch of business for us. Maybe I, I better pay attention to him, what he's got to say. And um, the, uh, but that's a niche that because of where you are and who you are since you're 18, you know, would be much more easily uh, penetrated than starting from something else. But you're right, if, you, if you're at a dead end, you know, the things that I talk about, should open up your vistas. I mean, so you're looking at much larger vistas. And the, um, you know, we, you know, when you said that number, normally, if we hadn't been this far into it, people would say this guy's got to be wacky, 420 million dollars. And but see, people say that to me. I have people that, you know, I want to have a two billion dollars or one billion dollars. And Rick Scott told you told me that in 1987. And uh, the uh, probably Rick said his goal's too low. As it turns out, I mean, when he was flapping his mouth when we were drinking, you know, martinis that night at the Ritz Carlton in Houston, I mean, he probably didn't think, thought a lot, the number stuff as big as Texas. But now, look at, he is, he is the health market industry in the United States. What, what does he, does he buy clinics or what? Oh, well, the, all the HMOs, is that the right terminology? He, he owns basically the HMO industry in the United States. I mean, he, you know, he has Columbia Healthcare and the, the eight or nine or ten largest healthcare companies, except for Ross Luce. Uh, what's the other one? The, Kaiser. Travel. I don't know if he bought that one or not, but the, I mean, there's five or six other ones left. But I mean, he is now the biggest in the country. 
and uh, the uh, Rotary Clinton. That's her name, right? What, whatever her name is. Whatever her name. Well, yeah, the, 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 uh, Miss her, President, her. it's, it's going to have to go to him to talk about the what the health industry wants. And um, so, but he he went where there was cash, and I, I, if I remember correctly, he said I want to I'm going to get a twenty billion dollar company. I'm going to have twenty billion because he's heard my speech. What if I had said twenty billion instead of two billion? He heard that a long time ago, and so, but now he's almost at twenty billion, and he's only forty one years old. Now there's an article, it's in your packet, I believe, where they say it's, it's over. He's overstretched. He can't do it. And uh, last year he made a $6 billion acquisition. And normally they would tell you, uh, conventional wisdom says, it takes you four or five years to assimilate this and this and that. 45 days later, he made a $4 billion acquisition. And then oh, he, he stewed for a while. And then he just made a $3 billion a few weeks ago. You know, and because he knows conventional wisdom is just not worth the powder to blow you to hell. But now they're coming out with articles, it's over. He's finally swallowed up too much, it's over. Wouldn't be surprised, you know, uh, Rick is either going to sell it or he's going to make another four or five billion dollar acquisition. I mean, and uh, he started it with a, an investment of $150,000. His life and savings at the time. Smart, smart guy. I still remember we were making a big acquisition. We were at the Ritz. And one of my techniques for negotiating, you got your people, I got my people. Is everybody here that can make a decision? Fine. We locked the doors. Click, 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 click. I put a, a trash in out in the middle. This is where we're going to, right here in this can. <laughs> Men, women, and child. Nobody's leaving the room until this baby either lives or dies. Nobody. You'd be surprised how... The liquid consumption sucks up. All of a sudden, nobody's bringing coffee. Shut me out. I'm not pissing in front of people. I'm bothering me. I'm drinking, drinking, drinking like this.